The Rosicrucian's teaching is that the world soul is not a soul lacking a body, but that, on the contrary, it is clothed in the garments of the most tenuous and ethereal substance, a substance as much finer and more ethereal than the ether of space, of the material scientist as the latter is much finer and more ethereal than the hardest steel or granite. From this ethereal substance, the world soul weaves bodies for its manifestation, even the densest forms of matter, and even the tenuous bodily form of the highest forms of life, far removed from our comparatively gross earth plane. The Rosicrucians further hold that it is not correct to think of the world soul as having been created out of nothing by the eternal parent, and still less so think of it as having been create, created from the substantial essence of the eternal parent by division, separation, or partition, such ideas being held to be logically impossible and fallacious. On the contrary, it is held that the world so exists as an ideal of the eternal parent, just as in a daydream or a reverie or a full dream we may picture a thing as in being. Or, in other terms, even the world soul exists merely as a picture in the infinite imagination of the eternal parent, and at the last is but a shadow of reality, and not reality itself. The world soul, at the dawn of the cosmic day, may be said to be like a dreamer freshly awakened from a deep sleep, and striving to regain consciousness of himself. It does not know what it is, nor does it know that it is but an ideal of the eternal parent. If it could express its thoughts and words, it would say that it has always been, but had been asleep before the moment. It feels within itself the urge toward expression and manifestation along unconscious and instinctive lines, this urge being a part of its nature and character and implanted into it by the content of the ideal of the eternal parent which brought it into being. Like the newborn babe, it struggles for breath and begins to move its limbs. And as it struggles and moves, there comes to it a response from all of its nature, and its active life begins. And here we leave the world so, for the moment, struggling for breath and striving to move its limbs, figuratively speaking, of course. Its future is related in the succeeding aphorisms which I will get to in the next... Oh, no, wait a minute. I've only just started this one. We'll get to it right now. The Universal Androgyny. In the secret doctrine of the Rosicrucians, we find the following third aphorism. The third aphorism. The one became two. The neuter became bisexual, male and female. The two in one evolved from the neuter, and the work of generation began. In this third aphorism of creation, the Rosicrucian is directed to apply his attention to the conception of the world soul, the first manifestation of the eternal parent, as a bisexual universal being. This bisexual universal being, combining within itself the elements and principles of both masculine, masculinity and femininity, is known as the Rosicrucian teachings in the Rosicrucian teachings as a universal hermorphodite and the universal androgyny. The term hermorphodite is defined as an individual which has the attributes of both male and female. The term is derived by joining together the two names Hermes and Orphodite. The term came into ancient use through the legend of Hermaprodidius, son of Hermes and Orthodite, who, while bathing, became joined in one body with the nymph Salmascus. The term androgyny is defined as an individual possessing the attributes of both male and female, a hermorphodite. The term is derived from the combination of two Greek words versus andros, meaning a man, and gen, meaning a woman, androgyny. The conception of the 
bisexuality of the universal manifestation or universal being is one met with on all sides in the ancient, esoteric, and occult philosophies in all lands. In ancient Greece, ancient India, and in ancient Atlantis, Persia, and Chaldea, the doctrine formed an important part of the inner teachings. In its highest form, this teaching lay at the very heart of the ancient mysteries and resulted in the very highest and noblest conception of the dignity and worthiness of sex. But prostituted by the vulgar, vulgar popular mind, encouraged by a debased priesthood, the same teachings were inverted and made to serve as a basis of the various degenerate phase of Phallic worship the traces of which are found on every page of ancient philosophical or religious history. The Rosicrucians have never countenanced even the slight descent into phallicism, but, on the contrary, have kept alive the flame of the true teaching and have used its particular symbol as the distinctive symbolic name and emblem of the order. In order to understand the symbology of the universal androgyny, it is necessary to first become familiar with the two ancient symbols of sex. In all the ancient philosophies and religions, we find that the cross is the symbol of the male and the circle the symbol of the female. In representing the bisexual, the herma, hermaphrodite, the androgyny, the two symbols, the cross and the circle are combined in one of several ways. The original way was that of placing the cross within the circumference of the circle, but later usage preferred the various forms of the so-called phallic cross, which consist of the circle or oval sustaining the cross, which de depends downward from it. Sometimes the cross is represented as the letter T and the circle as the letter O. The well-known esoteric symbol, the swastika, consists of a modified cross conceived as a whirling wheel, something like the familiar spinning pinwheel of the boy's fireworks. The whirling cross of the swastika, when seen in rapid motion, presents the appearance of a circle enclosing a circle. The symbol of the circle enclosing the cross is one particularly sacred to the Rosicrucians, since to them it represents the universal activity and universal creation, symbolizing the great mystery of occult generation on all planes of life. In the fanciful symbology of the ancient Rosicrucian brotherhoods, the circle was transformed into the rose, and the cross sometimes transformed into the sword with its cross-like handle. The sign, then, of the cross or sword combined with the circle or rose symbolized the mystic union of the rose and the cross, from whence arose the name of the order, Rosa, Crucian, order or Rosa, and Crucian meaning ro uh, rose cross. The third aphorism states the one became two, the neuter became bisexual, male and female, the two in one evolved from the neuter, and the work of creation began. In this aphorism, there is given the hint at the very important teaching of the Rosicrucians concerning the universal sex principles in nature, the presence and activity of the sexual pairs of opposites, male and female, which constitute the secret of creation. According to the secret doctrine of the Rosicrucians, there are present in all creation the activities of a male principle and a female principle, both universal in nature, character, and extent, both opposing aspects of the world so, which act and react one upon the other, and thus produce all creative activity, and the cosmic becoming or universal activity and change, and the teachings also are that these two sex principles operate and manifest upon every plane of life, from the sub-mineral on to the mineral, on to the plant, on to the animal, on to the human, 
own to the superhuman, own to the angelic or godlike, and likewise that in everything in creation there is present and manifest the activity of sex. The above statement of the universe, universality of sex may seem somewhat surprising to the person who has not acquainted himself or herself with the ancient wisdom of the esoteric schools, or who is not familiar with the daring conceptions of advanced modern science, but to one that has mastered the ancient wisdom teachings, and who has likewise become acquainted with the best of modern advanced scientific thought, there will seem nothing strange about these statements. The ancient teachings taught positively that there was present and active sex in all manifested creation, and modern science is beginning to teach that the evidence of the presence of sex in everything is conclusive. The ancient teachings, which were later embodied in the early Rosicrucian teachings, held that in order that there might be becoming, change, or creation, there must be reaction following action the play of one force on another. And the best teaching of the ancients were that these two opposing forces of nature were masculine and feminine, respectively, dual aspects of the universal being. And modern science is fast coming to recognize and teach the same great truth. The best teaching of modern science is that there is a stimulating or fertilizing activity in nature which acts upon a generative force the latter reacting upon the former. And at the other end of the material scale, we find the teaching that the atom, once supposed to be the ultimate form of matter, is now discovered to be composed of a multitude of electrons, corpuscles, or ions, different names for the same thing, revolving around each other at a tremendous rate of, of motion. It was formerly supposed that the electrons simply revolved one around another and that all were alike in character and nature. But the latter discoveries show that the formation of the atom is due rather to the action of numerous circling positive or male electrons around a central negative or female electron. The positive or male electrons seemingly exerting a peculiar effect upon the negative or female electron, causing her to put forth certain energies which result in the generation of the atomic structure. This is per in perfect accordance with the old Rosicrucian doctrine that the positive pole of magnetism and electricity, for both were well known to the ancient alchemist, was masculine, and that the neg negative pole of the same was feminine. But unfortunately, the terms positive and negative respectively are used with the wrong implication, and much confusion results therefrom. For instance, the term positive is used to indicate strength and reality as opposed to weakness and unreality of the negative. But the real facts of physical science shows us the falsity of such an interpretation of these terms. The so-called negative pole of the battery is really the pole of generation, or the production of new forms and energies. The best authorities now prefer to use the term the cathode pole in place of the negative. The word cathode being derived from the Greek word meaning descent the path of generation, etc. From the cathode, cathode pole of the battery emerge the great swarms of electrons, ions, or corpuscles. And from the same pole also emerge the wonderful rays which have played such an important part in modern physics. The cathode, the cathode pole of the battery is the mother of all that strange brood of new forms of matter with which have appeared to confute the old materialistic theories and to destroy the old conceptions of science. The cathode pole should, in reality and truth, be called the female pole and the positive the male, for such terms truly represent their true respective offices. 
modern science also teaches, that the electrons which are composed of negative female electricity frequently become detached from its male companion corpuscles and starts on an independent career. It seeks a union with a masculine corpuscle, and gaining it, a new set of creative activities is begun. When the female corpuscle unites with the new masculine, one, a strange phenomena occurs. The corpuscles begin vibrating and circling around each other, and the result is the birth of a new atom in which is combined the masculine and feminine energies in some particular proportion. The atom thus formed does not manifest the properties of free electricity, but manifests an entirely new set of properties. The process of detachment of the feminine electrons is called ionization, and arising from such detachments and the formation of new unions result the varied phenomena of heat, light, electricity, magnetism, etc. In the same way, the varied phenomena of chemical attraction and chemical affinity arise from the manifestation of sex on the atomic plane, though science has not yet, as yet, perceived this to be the truth. Science teaches that there are marriages, divorces, and remarriages among the atoms, but it hesitates to go further and assert that this is a part of the universal sex manifestation. But this announcement must come in time for the evidence is overwhelmingly convincing. The explosive properties of certain substances really result from a divorce of the atomic and molecular parties. The detachment of the male and female particles under the influence of a stronger attraction and the formation of the different substances results from the attractive unions of certain male and female elements of matter. Alchemy has always known this to be a fact. It remains for modern science to cooperate, corroborate and reaffirm the vagarities of the old alchemist regarding this important fact of nature. It has always been admitted by science that there was sex manifest in plant life as well as in animal life, but the mineral life was not given the benefit of the manifestation of the universal principle of sex. But recent discoveries have forced upon scientists the fact that in the crystallization of minerals, there is an unmistakable evidence of the presence and activity of sex. And in the near future, it will be found that all the other changes in minerals are the result of sex attraction or repulsion. And as we shall see in a subsequent chapter of this book, there is present the activity of sex on the mental planes of life. In short, on each and every plane of life, physical, mental, or spiritual, there is found present and active the universal principle of sex in some of its phases and forms. Sex cannot be escaped in nature. The universe is bisexual, and all creation on every plane is caused by sex and sex only. A full understanding of this important fact would revolutionize the conceptions of modern science and render practical, practicable many important ideas which now exist merely as dreams in the minds of the advanced scientist. To those who cannot see this plainly, we would say it is admitted that all physical and mental phenomena depend for activity upon the law of attraction. When it is discovered that the law of attraction proceeds along the lines of sex and sex alone, then it is seen that all activity is sex activity. Had the world soul remained neuter, there would have been no universal manifestation or creation. It was necessary that the principle of sex should appear in order that creation should begin. It is only by the constant and continuous action and reaction of the two sex principles in nature that creation, process, becoming, and change is possible. And as all things are but the products of change, process, becoming, and creation, it follows that without sex there would have been 
two things in the universe, and in that even the world soul would have abided apart, alone and single, until the end of its days. With the introduction of sex came the beginning of generation and creation, under which the one became the many, and sameness became variety and diversity. The ancient teachings furnish the only logical explanation of creation. The one becomes the two, and from the two proceed the many.